into the Pompidou Center up through a series of escalators we're going into this wonderful contemporary building designed by Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers perhaps the first of the postmodern buildings ever constructed and from the top you have a commanding view looking out over the city there's a rooftop garden terrace there's also a cafeteria up on the upper level with a restaurant nice view looking down at the Stravinsky fountains and across the rooftops of the city. We'll be taking an extensive look at the collections of the National Museum of Modern Art. The collections take up two entire floors. This is one of the best museums of modern art that you can find anywhere. Great large pieces by Leger, uh, important French modern artist of the 1920s, the industrial age showing up in his canvases. Kandinsky, the first of the abstract painters. We're going to take you through an extensive analysis of many of these paintings with our teacher, Peter Hansen, of the Punahou School Art Department for a very stimulating look at many of the paintings and some of the sculptures as we travel along with our students from Punahou School. Chagall also represented here at the Modern Art Museum along with hundreds of other artists. So what's your first impressions? Okay, I see a wow. thumbs up. I hear a wow. What else? BS. Sensory overload. BS. I heard some that yes. BS, <laughs> what is this even here? What else? Intense. Intense. The way I go through galleries is I go through the rooms pretty quickly and then I go back to certain pieces. So that's like kind of what we're gonna do now a little bit. But I wanna bring up something that Cole brought up. He brought up the idea of something that's BS. Like, I don't understand why is this person doing this and why is it on the wall? So we're gonna actually gonna do that first. We're gonna go to Cole's piece first, okay? So Cole, okay. would you lead us? Why is this guy up here. Why, if I did something exactly like this, could I be up there too? And it's like, why is this guy so talented? Why is he like, ooh, famous? You're famous, you can do stuff like yeah, I've never heard of that famous. guy. Okay, that brings up a good point. What's the point? Why did someone decide to do this and come up with this? If I pull out this key and say, this is art, it's is it? It's art, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily consider this art. I wouldn't put this in a museum and say, it's a hotel room key, even though probably Duchamp would probably do something like that, right? And push the limits of what that means, right? So is always art something that's rendered perfectly, like a, a portrait? No. So what you're noticing is a vast change in the art world coming from what modernism did into nowadays, what's going on here. So I'm going back to my original question here is why? I think, I think what Cole's trying to say is this, that anybody and everybody can do it. If you spent a half an hour, you could do something like that. Especially the all white one and the all black one. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, I no. personally think... No, no, no. That brings up some valid points. Kate. Okay, I think that like if he meant something by it, then that would make it different than if I did this. Because if I did this, I'd just be, yeah, I'm gonna put this up on the wall. But that is completely different from him trying to show something or prove something or put an idea into it. Okay, look at the white and consider that the positive space. Okay, the positive space. Look at the black and consider that the negative space. Does that change some of the idea behind this? Okay, Cole says no, some people say yes. This could be half empty, that one could be half full. So those start becoming what we call interpretations of the piece. The way I interpret this piece is just a way of looking at the negative and positive shapes, both by looking at them just as shapes and how they break up the plane, as well as the plane coming this way. So there's two planes, the picture plane as well as the three-dimensional plane. Who said that this is worthy to be up here? Somebody else saw the value in this. Cole is saying, well, I could do this. Well, yeah, you probably could, but you didn't. Somebody else did it before you, right? And got it up here in that sense and are 
pushing your ideas this way. Somebody else found value in this and that's why it's up here. Okay, you may personally not see the value in this, but it's there. Okay, just something to think about. You're, that's, the, that's what you're probably fighting again, and I fight this myself, is what is really art? Is this truly art? Someone claims it is. Somebody else, what's another piece? The Marcel Duchamp spinning one? Okay, Nat, tell me a little bit about it. What was intriguing you about this? Usually when you see a piece of art, it doesn't change in front of you, mm -hmm. but because these are spinning, the images are constantly looking different and evolving, I guess, and I thought that was Interesting. Excellent. That's the main point about the whole piece itself. That uh, Mar Marcel Duchamp, well, typical him, pushing the ideas of what art's really about. Art is not static. It's very kinetic. It can move. It can shape. It can change things. And that's what he's, he's saying about this piece. They're going to change. The way you perceive it, the way you're seeing it, is going to change. Notice it stops and the position of each piece changes. There's not, it doesn't stop exactly at the exact same moment. It's always slightly different. And that's what part of what he was talking about, is that very simple, very simple concept, but the idea that this is gonna change as it rotates and moves around. Each thing has its own line quality to it. Duchamp was really into looking at measurements, and looking at ideas of lengths of things, and each one has its own thing too. So how long it travels around and around has its own length as well. So there's a little deeper meaning amongst, amongst this. What's interesting is this, this piece, particularly this piece, started influencing some of the op art that happened in the 60s. Quickly, let's move over to this little hallway thing there. This is his Mobile Art Museum. So you can start recognizing some of the pieces. You see the urinal, the nude descending the staircases, so it's all compact. You can carry it with you. Open it up. There's your, your modern art museum with you. But he did, uh, for example, a piece what he called measurements. All he did was did a series of measurements with string and put them in a box. And so you could take them out and look at the measurements, standard of measurements. He was questioning the idea that is, is everything in centimeters, inches, you know, those kind of things. So he's creating his own standard of measurements. Duchamp. This is again another Duchamp piece. This is a series of pieces that he did. It's an influence off of futurism. You guys know what futurism is, right? Mm -hmm. Someone tell me what futurism besides coal. Okay. Showing the movement. Showing movement, exactly. That's what futurism is about. So for example, nude descending the staircase. You guys remember that one? The idea of the, how the movement of the nude moving down the staircase. What's interesting about this particular piece is that when he made these pieces, the glass was not cracked. Now when they arrived, they were cracked, okay? And it was interesting is that he was pulled to the museum and said, whoops, and he looked at it and said, well, no, that works. And he continued, and he left them that way. And it was really interesting how these are, basically how he created these two, is two, two plate glasses with the, the pieces in between. But the cracks really kind of helps the idea, what he felt was the movement of the piece as well as the idea of dynamism, which is again about futurism. This piece is called the nose. How do you look at a sculptural piece? From all angles. From all angles, good, excellent. So this will be a good idea, this, if you haven't done this yet, do a quick kind of 360 look at it. And pay particular attention to how the figure or the, the head and the nose interreact or interrelate with the rectangle. What are you seeing right now? What did you see? Um, I saw it from all angles. Okay. More or less. And um, tried to notice the interreactions between the rectangle and the nose. But you know what's interesting is most artists stay within, within the box. If you look at the paintings, for example, or other things, they stay within a set format. This particular piece is going and jutting out beyond it. It's breaking the plane. It's challenging those other things. Notice it's also how balanced it is. I mean, they have to have this little piece of, uh, of fishing line to hold it in place because it's so balanced like this. But the shaking of the floor, you can see when I just shook the floor a little bit, 
it shakes the whole piece itself just a little bit. So to hold it in there. So it's a nice balance between two. And that's part of what Giacometti was doing too, is looking at balance, balancing of, of things. He talked about trying to find the perfect form. He felt that each time he did a sculpture that he got infinitely closer to the perfect form. How is, going back to this nose part, how is this looking like the perfect form? I don't know. Okay, is always form about what's here? Is also form the way things are balanced, the way things are projected? And that's what he's kind of looking at. And that's why I want you guys to take a look at this and kind of go, well, wait a minute. This is about balancing the form out. Okay? So what Giacometti is also saying too is that our bodies are not perfect. They're not. And they're not. Mechanically and everything else, they're not the best machines. Okay? And that's what he's looking at is, well, can I make the perfect form? Can I build the perfect form? Each time, again, he made a sculpture, the closer he got. So just something to think about. Kandinsky. Oh. You guys talk about Kandinsky? Yes, talk okay. About what did you guys? A lot of like his paintings and works, like there is no specific image. It was just like there's supposed to be a feeling by mm -hmm. the way he used like colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Excellent. So it's really about colors, shapes, planes, the the actuality that's there, but also the what he could like to call the spiritual plane of different things. Okay. So when you look at this. What kind of feelings come from you guys? What do you guys see? What do you guys? They're falling. Okay, you have a, sens a sensation of it falling. How did you get that? Because like this is the sky, and there's nothing to hold them up. So. And this is one of the reasons why I picked this particular piece. Most of you are trying to make <coughs> subject matter out of this particular piece. Okay, this is a crocodile, and this is a bird, and those kind of things. It's really not about that. It's really about how the colors interplay with each other, and what sh how these shapes evoke something for you. They may not evoke anything for you. Okay, and that's the part of the thing about Kandinsky. Okay, let's gather on that piece real quick, that other Kandinsky real quick. Okay, what do you guys see? Circles, great. What else? Square. Okay, square. Good. What else? Colors. Okay. Colors. What else? Texture? Yes. Okay. There's texture. Okay. Different hues, right? Colors. Is, is there a proportion? Okay. Yes. How cool? Like there's a big thing next to a little thing and it makes one stand out better. Perfect. One is larger than something else. Perfect. This, compared to this, this is much larger than this. Compared to this to this, that's much larger than that. So yes, there is proportion. Is there a variety? Yes. Yes. Variety in what? Color, shape, size. Color, shape, size. Beautiful. Is the piece balanced? Mm -hmm. Symmetrically? Is that what you're talking about? Balanced meaning either symmetrically or asymmetrically. Okay, there's a, it seems to feel a little bit like this on this side. That's what it feels to me. It's, it feels like it's pulling. There's an emphasis definitely on this side. Mainly because of what? A red circle. And what's interesting, this is called accents of rose. So this is a rose color, so it's pulling you. Notice we just talked about it formally. You guys pulled up all those different things, which was great. What you saw there, again, no subject matter. But yet you talked about it formally, and that's an excellent way to do that. Okay, let's, let's move to a Francis Bacon. That one makes my head hurt. What do you guys see? A guy on the toilet. Okay, what else? Okay, guy on the stool. Okay, what else? Okay, guy on the couch. Okay, what else? They're all on a round thing. Okay, they're all on a round thing. They could be really small. Okay, talk to me a little bit more about spotlight. Where do you have spotlights? On a stage. On a stage. This is all about being a st on a stage. Yeah, you're looking at them slightly down, right? Like you're on a balcony looking down on this whole thing, okay? Why would you want to look down on something like this? Pardon me? Feel superior. Okay, there's a, maybe a sense of feeling of, of superiority. Okay, what else? Feels like you're watching them, but they can't see you. Excellent. You're watching them, they can't really see you. 
So you're looking into these people's lives or this person's particular person's lives, okay, in the different parts of their sta stages in a sense. You guys remember Mojong? Okay, tell me a little bit about Mojong, Aaron. Yeah. Um, he did a lot of the black lines with the, like, the primary colors in boxes, and I guess he was just, he just liked to use the primary colors a lot. Okay. So why primary colors? Simple as colors. Primary colors are the ones that create the other secondary, treasury, etc. those other colors. So Modrand is, yes, you guys picked it up really well, which is the simplification of things. Again, simplification in many different levels. He wanted to simplify everything down to the basic essence, which he felt was geometric shapes. Or if you, and if you look at most natural things, there are a lot of things that are geometric shapes within nature themselves. If you break them down, crystals, those things, the building blocks. You're watching Hawaii Geographic Society's World Traveler. We're on an art tour of Europe with some students from Punahou School. Right now we're enjoying a detailed visit to the Pompidou Center, which has the National Museum of Modern Art in Paris. Our tour and discussion is led by Peter Hansen on the faculty of the art department at Punahou School. Okay, I want to propose something to you guys to think about something. Abstract art versus realistic art. Okay, now give me an example of what you consider realistic art. Leonardo. Leonardo. Okay, why is that? Because he painted it what it looked like. like kind of like realism. Okay, he paints what he thinks looks real. Okay, or he sculpts yeah. something that he looks real, right? Okay, everybody can agree with that. Yeah. Okay, I propose to you that that is actually more abstract in thought yeah. than realism. The realistic painters and sculptors are saying, don't look at the marble, don't look at the paint. It's an illusion. This person, this sculpture is about to come alive. This painting, you could walk into it and be interact with it. Well, these guys are saying, no, 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 no. Look at the paint. Look at the, what this stuff is made out of. Okay, it's real. So in a sense, they're more realistic than the realistic painters or sculptors. Because they are saying, look at the material. What is this all about? And this, I want you to keep that in mind as we go through some of the pieces. Okay, tell me a little bit about Andy Warhol. He did a whole series of these paintings where he just duplicated image. Okay. What kind of image was it? Um, sometimes it was celebrities, sometimes it was things like car crashes and things like that that he thought that people were preoccupied with. Okay, and why did he duplicate them so, so much? Because he wanted to convey the mass-produced view in the society. Mm -hmm. Excellent, the mass-produced part of it, but also when you see the image repeat itself so many times, does it have an impact on you anymore? Does the image itself have a, a unique impact? No. It kind of goes, oh, okay. Like when you see a gruesome car crash and you see it reproduced several times, if you kept looking at it over and over and over again, you become a lot more immune to the car crash or the excitement of the car crash. And that's what Andy was also trying to push to, was the idea of looking at these icons. And who is this? Liz Taylor. Liz Taylor, which she's big right? Repeat her several times and after a while it's like, okay, it's just Liz. She's an ordinary person like you and me. Okay, and that's what he's kind of pushing in the idea of that behind that. Does anybody want to talk about a particular piece? Why did you want to pick this piece? Okay, if you look at it from this angle like where I'm standing, it looks like three-dimensional, like some parts are pushing out and some parts are put going back. Mm -hmm. If you look at it head-on, you don't see that part. It looks flat with just V-like lines. Mm -hmm. And then you walk around the other side, you get the same um, push it, pushing out and receding backward. Uh -huh. So Ex like if you look at it from a different point of view, it looks completely different. Excellent. And that's part of what he's talking about, looking at it as a f not only the, you know, 
paintings can be looked at at different points of views as well and change its meaning just like a, a piece of sculpture. So again, somewhat illusionary, but not really. Again, looking at the paint and just the way the lines interact with each other. This is a lot about the optical illusion that you're creating. This is, uh, Frank was a lot of into some of that. Frank Stella was part of into the optical illusions of things. Uh, your eyes playing tricks on you. Cole picked it up beautifully on that when the idea of it changes, looks three dimensional as it comes up this way, and yet it changes as it walks around on the other side as well. Uh, he also has done other ones with uh, multicolored ones as well as just a lot of times just playing flat fields with these uh, lines coming through here. Yeah, nice job. This piece, this piece, and this piece are examples of, of, of what type of art? Minimalistic. Ex excellent. This one. What is it made out of? Felt. Felt. What is it doing? Hanging. Okay. Is there a particular repeating shape? Yeah, the curve, right? Robert Morris, did, who's, who's the responsible for this particular piece, did a lot of questioning about form and the anti-form, looking at what builds form and what destroys form. Okay, so looking at this, what's actually creating the form? Spaces in between. The spaces in between. It's really not about the felt, it's really about the spaces in between. Okay, so looking at that and keeping that concept in mind, Donald Judd, right against the wall over here. What happens when you look up the piece from down from the floor as you start looking at towards the top? Spacers get smaller. Spacers get smaller. Do the box, boxes get larger? They get smaller. Really? No, they're exactly the exact same size. But yet the way the light interplays with you, what I lo love about this piece is the way the light plays, in, plays on the wall, the shadows, how they interplay with each other. And that's a lot of what minimalist art was talking about is how the piece interacts with the environment that it's in. Prime example is Dan Flavin. We'll take a look at this one real quick. Dan Flavin was all about light and how light inter interacts with form and creates form. Notice the corner. Is that painted or is that the light creating that? Painted. It's the light. It's painted. It's painted. <laughs> Again, it's the interaction between everything, but it's really about noticing something new and how everything interacts with it. With it. Really, it's about the individual artists expressing themselves or finding a new way or giving, providing an opportunity for you to look at the world in a new way. I want you to keep questioning why they're doing this kind of thing. So if you're questioning that, excellent. Continue doing that. Always continue doing that. Why? Some of the installations here in the Pompidou Center are quite dramatic. More than just a painting or a sculpture, they force you to think. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting because of the placement of the piano in that room with the felt, because they're really contrasting the pianos to make noise and the felts to absorb the noise. Mm, very good. So there's an in interesting meaning between that, the idea of the noise maker piano, etc., and the, the noise absorber, okay? With the felt, again, the nice off play, the, the tension between the two, felt absorbing the piano, creating the, the, the noise itself. When you walk in there, the, the felt absorbs so much of the noise that your ears are so used to hearing noise that it just, there's a certain part that starts ringing for you. And that's one of the first sensations when I walked in the room. I mean, Cole and I walked in together, and he's like, what the hell is going on in here? You know, the question I'm going to ask, what do you guys see? Five. Number five. Oh. OK. Oh. Someone said it. Yeah, Shannon said it. Pop art. Pop art, right? Pop art was going on. So why five? The number system is something that you use all the time, right? Something that you recognize. A five written like this is a five, whether it's in English, French, German, right? It's a five. This is almost a universal language in a sense. So again, it's, a, it's something that's a pop image. It's an image that you can recognize pretty quickly. Okay, what I li really love about Jasper Johns is again, when I talked about the, you know, the paint, looking at the paint, he wants you to not only look at the image itself, but the paint, 
the quality of it, looking at it, the different levels of the different uh, brush strokes that he used, the type of thickness of paint. <laughs> okay, one last piece. I like, I like this piece because it's like, if you look through all the different panes of glass, the colors inside are like camouflage. When you look through each different pane of glass, so they become white. Mm -hmm. So like if you look through this red over here, all you see is the black and the white. And when you look right through the center and you look into that ball, you see everything. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a piece that kind of tells you to just look at things with like different, with different views. Or people look at everything with like different views or something. Mm -hmm. This is just the way everybody looks at things differently. Okay, excellent. And again, what Davin talked about, which is excellent, looking at the different colors, they change as you move this way. All of a sudden, everything starts to change. Particularly in this side also too, you'll see a lot of different changes. The hues change quite a bit. So it's an optical illusion the way this whole, whole installation works. Your eyes start completing the piece. You could spend hours looking at this piece. You could spend a lot more time in this museum. It's huge. There it is in the background, give you some idea of the size.